Hi everyone, and welcome to our lecture on hemostasis. Before we start, let's quickly define hemostasis. As you can tell from the name, hemo means blood, and stasis means to stop. So it's a process that occurs in the body to prevent damaged blood vessels to stop bleeding. Now there are a couple of steps that are involved in hemostasis. It starts off with the injury to the blood vessel, causing blood loss to occur. Then a series of events happen, leading to the formation of platelet plug, which is also called primary hemostasis. Once the platelet plug has been formed, the body makes it stronger by the coagulation cascade, which is also called secondary hemostasis. This forms the complete blood clot, thus marking the end of hemostasis. Now once the blood clot has been formed, it allows repair of the blood vessel to take place. Once repair of the blood vessel and the surrounding structures has taken place, fibrinolysis occur to dissolve the blood clot. This is just the summary to give you a brief idea of what we'll be discussing in this video. Now before we jump into discussing these steps one by one, we need to understand what is naturally keeping the blood from coagulating. Why is it that your natural blood flow does not coagulate but it only coagulates when there is damage to the blood vessel? So we'll cover first what are the substances or proteins that are responsible for this mechanism. So this is our diagram that I'll be working upon in this video. Here you can see the blood vessel it is lined by the endothelial cells. Underneath the endothelial cells lies the subendothelial connective tissue, which is composed of collagen. Underneath the subendothelial connective tissue uh, are the smooth muscles, which are responsible for contraction and dilation of the blood vessel. Also, there are these yellow receptors called the noise receptors, commonly known as pain receptors. The endothelial cells release substances called PGI2 and nitric oxide. PGI2 can also be referred to as prostacyclin. Anyways, what PGI2 and nitric oxide they do is they together they inhibit platelets from activating. So they prevent the formation of the platelet plug, thereby inhibiting the blood from coagulating. Another protein that is released by the endothelial cells is called the heparin sulfate. This protein binds onto antithrombin 3, which is another protein which happens to be roaming around in the blood. So once antithrombin 3 binds on to heparin sulfate. Antithrombin 3 gets activated and it further goes on to inhibit factors 2, 9, 10 and 12. And these factors are produced by the liver and they're involved in the coagulation cascade which we'll discuss later in the video. So for now just remember the function of antithrombin 3 once it's activated. One last protein I want to mention is thrombomodulin. Uh, this protein binds on to thrombin which is also called factor 2 and it modulates thrombin's function. Now we just mentioned a second ago that factor 2 is part of the coagulation cascade and is involved in coagulation. So how can it be possible that it's responsible for anticoagulation of the blood as well? See the idea here is fairly simple. Once thrombin binds on to thrombomodulin, its function is changed or modulated. So instead of acting as a coagulant, it acts as an anticoagulant. Well how does it do it? Well it takes protein C which is present in the blood in its inactive form and it converts it into its active form. Once protein C is activated, it further goes on to inhibit factors 5 and 8, which are also involved in the coagulation cascade. And again, these factors will make much more sense once we get to a later section of this video. So for now, just bear in mind the function of activated protein C and how is it responsible for the natural anticoagulant blood flow. Okay, so we're done discussing the substances and proteins which are responsible for maintaining the physiologic anticoagulant state of the blood. So we'll move now into the steps which are involved in hemostasis. It starts off with the injury. So once the injury has taken place, it leads to the loss of blood. And the blood vessels, initially what they try to do is they try to minimize the amount of blood loss. So they do it by uh, constricting the blood vessels, also known as transient vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction following injury takes place mainly through two mechanisms. Remember earlier we mentioned that the endothelial cells, they release two substances um, which are responsible for the anticoagulant state. It's called nitric oxide and PGI2. However, once the blood vessels are damaged, uh, they cannot release those substances anymore. So they favor the procoagulant state more than the anticoagulant state. So the damaged endothelial cells, instead of releasing nitric oxide and PGI2, they release another substance which is called endothelin 1. Endothelin 1 then goes over to the smooth muscles which are present beneath the subendothelial connective tissue 
and cause them to contract, leading to vasoconstriction. Another way by which transient vasoconstriction takes place is through the nociceptor pathway. The idea here is that you have an injury which causes inflammation to occur and you know inflammation produces many cytokines. So these cytokines as a product of inflammation, they bind onto the nociceptors which are present nearby and they activate them. Once these nociceptors are activated, they have two effects. One is they trigger pain and second is they directly stimulate the muscles over here to contract. So these are the two ways by which transient vasoconstriction can take place. One is through the endothelin 1 release and second is through the nociceptor route. Okay, so we're done discussing the first two steps uh, which are involved in hemostasis. Let's move on to the third one which is formation of the platelet plug. This will mark the end of primary hemostasis. So we'll shift our injury to the right side so we have more room to work with. One of the substances which are released by endothelial cells when they get damaged is uh, von Willebrand factor. And this factor is very important because it's going to be the foundation of what we'll discuss further. Anyhow, what this factor does is it goes on to bind the damaged subendothelial collagen. Uh, remember there was injury which damages the endothelial lining of the blood vessel and it also damages the subendothelial connective tissue which is lying underneath. So once one Willebrand factor is released, it binds onto the damaged subendothelial collagen. The other end of the von Willebrand factor binds onto the platelets and it looks something like this. I will zoom into this area over here to show you what receptors platelets use to bind onto the von Willebrand factor. Platelets use their GP1B receptor to bind onto the von Willebrand factor. And note that this process of platelets binding onto the von Willebrand factor is also referred to as platelet adhesion. After platelet adhesion, platelets get activated and they release certain substances, namely ADP, calcium, thromboxane A2 and serotonin. Once ADP is released, it causes more platelets which are roaming around in the blood vessel to come towards the side of the injury, thus promoting platelet aggregation. And when more and more platelets are coming towards the side of the injury, and binding onto each other. They really fill the injured space with platelets which then ultimately stops the bleeding from occurring. And this eventually leads to the formation of platelet plug as you can see here. There is one more thing I want to mention regarding ADP. ADP also binds onto the ADP receptor on platelets known as P2Y12 receptor. This receptor once stimulated, it causes platelets to upregulate another receptor called GP2B3A receptor. This receptor is then used by platelets to bind onto each other. Remember we just said that to form the platelet plug we need lots of platelets coming together towards the side of the injury and binding onto each other. So guess how they bind onto each other? Well they do it through this receptor called GP2B3A and they use fibrinogen in the middle. So here we have zoomed in version of how platelet aggregation takes place. You can see platelets are bound to each other with this receptor again. GP2B3A and they're using fibrinogen in the middle. Alright, that's all for ADP. Let's move on to the other substances. Calcium is involved mainly in the coagulation cascade which we'll cover in the next step. Thromboxane A2 is also involved in platelet aggregation as well as it acts together with serotonin on smooth muscles leading to vasoconstriction thus preventing more blood from leaking out. Alright, so this marks the end of our third step now we'll move on to the final step in hemostasis called the coagulation cascade. This step will take quite some time and it's a difficult one to understand. So don't feel demotivated if you don't get it the first time. Just rewatch the step a few times and the concept will start making much more sense with repetition. Now before we start discussing the coagulation cascade, you should know the platelet plug we just formed from primary hemostasis is pretty weak and it could dislodge any time and can travel in the blood vessel to distant areas of the body eventually blocking the blood vessels over there and this could lead to some severe complications so all what coagulation cascade is doing is uh, making the platelet plug stronger by producing a fibrin mesh and attaching it on top of the platelet plug so really holding on to the platelet plug like a glue this as a result stabilizes the platelet plug and thereby completing the blood clot Let's dig into how this takes place. We have our platelet plug here from last slide. 
Note that the membranes of the platelets are made up of phosphatidylserines, which are negatively charged. Now there are a bunch of factors which are produced by the liver and then dumped into the blood. Um, one of them is factor 12, which happens to be passing by the platelet plug. When this factor comes in contact with the negatively charged platelet plug, it gets activated. Once factor 12 is activated, it acts as an enzyme and further goes on to activate factor 11. Activated factor 11 then converts factor 9 into its active form. Then another factor called factor 8 combines with activated factor 9 and together they activate factor 10. This step requires the presence of platelet factor 3 and calcium. Now activated factor 10 then uses factor 5 as a coenzyme to convert factor 2 into its active form which is called thrombin. Uh, note that this step also requires the presence of platelet factor 3 and calcium. Thrombin then converts fibrinogen into fibrin. What happens here is that thrombin acts as an enzyme and converts soluble fibrinogen into long sticky threads of insoluble fibrin. So basically it attaches pieces of fibrinogen together to form long threads of fibrin. And it is demonstrated here. Another function of thrombin is to activate factor 13 in the presence of calcium. Activated factor 13, what it does is it goes on to cross-link the fibrin threads we just produced by thrombin. And after the cross-linking, we get a fibrin mesh that can be placed over the platelet plug, finally completing our blood clot. And the mesh over the platelet plug really makes it stronger, so it does not get dislodged. One last thing I want to mention about thrombin is that it goes back to activate factors 5 and 8, so it basically provides a positive feedback and causes the blood clot to form as soon as possible. This pathway I just described is called the intrinsic pathway by which the coagulation cascade occurs. It is normally seen in trauma to the inside of the blood vessel. So basically if you hear about any internal cause by which bleeding is occurring associated with the int intrinsic pathway. There is another pathway I want to briefly mention is called the extrinsic pathway which is much quicker and skips all of these steps. The extrinsic pathway is due to an external injury or trauma to the tissues rather than an internal injury as seen in the intrinsic pathway. See, whenever there is an external trauma to a tissue, they release a certain type of factor called tissue thromboplastin, also known as factor 3. What tissue thromboplastin does is, it activates factor 7, which is also present in the blood. Activated factor 7 then directly goes on to activate this step over here, bypassing all of these steps to activate thrombin, and this pathway occurs much much faster than the intrinsic pathway. So for a quick summary, intrinsic pathway is due to an internal trauma mediated by Hagman factor, also called factor 12, whereas the extrinsic pathway is due to an external trauma mediated by tissue thromboplastin, also called factor 3. I know that the coagulation cascade can be a tough one to remember, so here I have summarized the coagulation cascade and I'll give you some tips used by some medical students like me to memorize it. So the intrinsic pathway starts off with factor 12. Keep subtracting 1 as you're going down into the consequent step. So if you subtract 1 from 12, you come down to 11. So subtract 1 again from 11, you come down to 10. Just skip the number 10 because that's part of the common pathway. So you come down to 9 and subtract 1 again from 9, you come down to 8. So that is the intrinsic pathway. That's the beginning of the intrinsic pathway. For the common pathway, it goes as factor 10, 5, 2, and 1. So if you start from the bottom and multiply 1 times 2 times 5, you get to 10. So that's one way you can remember the common pathway. For the extrinsic pathway, it's fairly simple. You just have two factors, factor 3 and 7. So just think of adding them up to reach the number 10. And then it follows the same common pathway we just discussed earlier. Before we finish up with hemostasis, I want to quickly touch upon some of the coagulation tests that are used to confirm the diagnosis of certain blood disorders. Three of which I will cover in this video are the prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, and bleeding time. So this is our summary on coagulation cascade, which we already discussed. Prothrombin time evaluates the factors which are involved in the extrinsic pathway and the common pathway. Factors tested in the extrinsic pathway is factor 7, 
and the factors which are tested in the common pathway are factors 1, 2, 5 and 10 and uh, normal prothrombin time is between 11 to 14 seconds. Moving on to the partial thromboplastin time. Partial thromboplastin time evaluates the factors which are involved in the intrinsic pathway and the common pathway. So factors which are tested in the intrinsic pathway are factors 12, 11, 9 and 8 and factors which are tested in the common pathway are factors 1, 2, 5 and 10 and normal partial thromboplastin time is between 25 to 35 seconds. That's all for the prothrombin and partial thromboplastin time. Next up is the bleeding time. Bleeding time is measured from the start of the bleeding till the time it takes to stop bleeding. It is measured by the finger prick method. It generally assesses the platelet function and I like to think of bleeding time as the time it takes to form the platelet plug because that's when the bleeding stops and the rest of the steps are just to stabilize the blood clot. Normal bleeding time is between 2 to 7 minutes. Okay, so this way we have finished hemostasis. The lab tests I just mentioned in the previous few slides will become more important when discussing blood disorders. I just thought of mentioning them here because it's something often tested in examinations. Anyways, let's move on to what happens to the blood clot after it has been formed. Blood clot generally allows area surrounding it to undergo repair and once repair has taken place, fibrinolysis occurred to dissolve the blood clot, returning everything back to normal. So this is our blood clot from last slide. During repair, platelets in the blood clot tend to contract, bringing the ruptured endothelial edges closer together. And also platelets release certain chemokines called platelet-derived growth factor vasculoendothelial growth factor and fibroblast growth factor. PDGF is responsible for regenerating the endothelial lining and smooth muscles. VEGF causes angiogenesis, which is recanalization of the blood vessel, uh, tissue repair, and also production of collagen, thereby repairing the subendothelial lining. FGF or fibroblast growth factor is also responsible for angiogenesis. Once repair has taken place, the job of the blood clot has finished and the body then dissolves the blood clot through fibrinolysis. The endothelial cells release tissue plasminogen activator which acts as an enzyme and converts inactive plasminogen present in the blood into its active form called plasmin. Plasmin then acts as an enzyme and goes on to degrade the blood clot into fibrin degradation products and uh, D-dimer. Note that D-dimer levels are clinically important because D-dimer levels are commonly measured by physicians to detect if their patients recently had a blood clot formation or not. Also, just for a side note for a function of plasmin, you should know that plasmin also degrades factor 1, which is fibrinogen, and also other factors like factors 5, 8, and 10. So basically, plasmin not only dissolves the existing blood clot, but it also prevents any further formation of blood clot. Alright, this marks the end of our lecture. I really hope everything made sense. If you found this video helpful, please like and share. And also make sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on the bell icon so you do not miss any future updates from us.